Dr. Steve Farnfield was a senior lecturer at the University of Roehampton, where his special interest was always in issues around child, childhood and children's development. His research was into young child observation, children's play and exploration and attachment, children's views of health and social care services, child maltreatment, assessing and working with children's attachments, and attachment and children with a disability. He is a world expert on child attachment, child development and assessing children. And recently he's been doing research at the Mulberry Bush School in Oxfordshire and we started our interview asking him about that. Pleasure. What we want to start with is really just to understand the children you're working with at the moment and to understand the kinds of problems that you're seeing and then we could get into understanding a bit about where those problems have come from and then in due course how you're trying to help well how you're assessing those problems and then how you're trying to help with those children and their families but first of all just to understand the kinds of problems that you're seeing in the children you're working with yes i'm i'm actually now no longer a, a if you like a practitioner or stroke therapist um, although I have done a lot of work with interventions with maltreated children mm. for a long, long time. Um, really now I'm more interested in research, uh, understanding children's problems and working with other professionals to, to see actually what uh, interventions might actually work. We've got mm. an awful lot of therapies available now, um, but they, are, they tended to be used somewhat according to what practitioners know. Um, what they feel comfortable with um, and sometimes you can apply the wrong intervention to, you know and it can actually do damage so I'm particularly interested in trying to understand things better um, currently um, the last research or the one I'm still engaged with is at the Mulberry Bush School which takes it's a residential school it was founded actually on psychoanalytic principles Winnicott for people who may be interested in following some of this stuff up. Uh, Winnicott, a very well-known child uh, paediatrician and analyst, uh, was heavily involved with it, along with Dr Drysdale, who helped set it up. Um, so, and the basic idea, I think, without I hope I'm doing them justice, is that the therapeutic milieu, the everyday living with the children, is therapeutic. But it does draw on um, psychodynamic ideas basically they actually come from Freud with a lot of changes along the way um, the children who go there are by and large children who people don't know what to do with sadly um, so these are children who've often had quite a lot of foster placements they're not all in foster care um, but they're children for whom often education uh, has proved to be too difficult on both sides both for children and teachers. Um, we looked at 50 children at the Barbie Bush. Can I just, can I just ask Steve, they're not actually learning disabled though, are they? They're not, no. So these are, these are within kind of normal, you know, they should be capable yeah. of learning. Yeah, in uh, fact, they're, that's right. Um, they're, I suppose, what used to be called emotionally and behaviourally disturbed children. So in mm. other words, they've, they've got emotional problems, but they're not... Um, Learning disabled, no. And they, and they come from all over the country, I think, don't they? They do. Yeah. And a lot of them are in care, aren't they? Subject to care orders, do you? Yeah, <clears throat> the majority of subject to care orders, um, although some, some of the ones that we did the study with, uh, I think about eight or nine were adopted, and actually a significant number were still living at home with their, mm. with their families. But uh, well over half were in foster care. Mm. Um, we actually compared them with children in a local authority from the same background. So in other words, these were children who'd been referred because of neglect or um, serious concerns about how they were doing at home. Um, and we actually matched them according to whether they were in foster care with families, ethnicity, uh, gender. And the Mulberry Bush children were significantly, had significantly more what, what are known as adverse childhood experiences, ACEs, Mm. Um, the usual catalogue of misery, really, domestic violence, drug, alcohol, physical abuse, and so forth. The, uh, those, the Mulberry Bush children so had a significantly more of those than the local authority group. 
Um, and I think often these children end up in, in residential care. Um, as a last resort now, as you know, fostering is actually usually the intervention of choice. Mm. Uh, foster care itself has, in my view, actually proved a disappointment, actually. I think um, there are, in some ways, we idealise foster care. I'm not saying we shouldn't be doing it, and you certainly don't want to return to big institutions for children. Um, but when children are being moved about the care system and don't have any stability, actually a residential placement might be preferable for some of them. If it can contain their problems yeah. and they don't have to keep moving. Yeah, and mm. if you actually can make a relationship with just one or two people over a significant period of time mm. and a relationship to place, that is actually is preferable than being just pinged about the system and moved about the country, which is often what happens to children in foster care. Mm. Just to be clear about that, the, the reason why they might have to move foster carers is because their problems are, I mean, it may be that the, the foster care is not adequate, but more likely the child's problems are more severe. Yeah. Um, the issue for, I suppose, for foster care is sometimes people are, you know, they're actually uh, licensed, if you like, to have young kids and then they get given an older one because mm. there isn't a place for them. Or that they only ever intended to, to have the child for six months and it drifts on into a year or two. But a lot of placements do break down because of the, quotes, behaviour of the child. So, in other words, these are children for whom family life is actually extremely difficult. And there's a limit to what a, a family can do. You know, it's a question of whether the kid goes to the mountain or the mountain goes to the child, really. Mm. Um, and when you get to residential care, yeah, the mountain has gone to the child, that's for sure. Mm. Um, whereas in foster care, it seems to be a bit of each. But the, one of, I think one of the topics we were going to look at um, and is interesting me at the moment is the issue of around just what's usually called affect regulation. So in other words, it's, it's the, ab the ability to manage your own state of arousal. And children who end up in serious difficulties typically have major problems with managing their states of arousal. So in other words, they stick out as, and they, they don't sit down, they walk around a lot, they don't listen to instructions, they get angry very quickly, they're unpredictable, um, or even manic, that's on one end of a scale. And on the other end of the scale, of course, you've got what would takes you right down into low states of arousal, very low mood and depression. But those children don't get referred as much as they should, actually. The quiet ones. Mm. The quiet ones. Yeah, they get mm. overlooked. Um, as do overconformist children. Um, I don't know whether it's, it might be gender specific to some extent. So you get girls who kind of conform to a state of, you know, 19th century femininity or something where actually they they do their homework and just keep quiet but actually when they get to puberty they turn out to be very ill-equipped for managing the the world ahead because actually what all they've really been doing is inhibiting trying to look good where actually they actually feel very anxious um, so some of those get missed actually um, and some of them are actually depressed as well mm. So with um, the, uh, we call it affect regulation or mood regulation, mm. is that because the children have learned to use their dysregulation, their out of control behavior, or is it, is it that they simply haven't learned? Because after all, they come from an environment where they will have had to learn some ways of behaving as a way of coping. I mean, as all, all children do in any family you're born into, you have to learn how to live in that family. And these children will have learnt something. So is their behaviour purposeful? That's a really good point, actually. Um, sometimes it is, actually. Sometimes it's what we call strategic. In other words, it's deliberately designed to cheese off the grown-ups. Uh, and you can get a long way in life by doing that, actually. Because <laughs> it gives um, you a degree of control, doesn't it? It, it certainly does. Um, Actually, that would be strategic, and that's less of a problem. It may be a problem for adults, but actually the child has a way of organising themselves within the environment. So in other words, if you feel invisible, kick off periodically and you get attention. Mm. 
the more serious problems are for children who are unable to do that, actually. Um, now, it might be worth taking this story back to, child, to infancy, because mm. that's obviously where it all starts. Um, as you, anybody who's had a baby knows that what you actually end up with is a sort of dif a bundle of diffuse anxiety on both sides quite often. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the baby is born desperate. Human babies are desperately immature. Um, when you look at other species, we really have set ourselves the mammoth task developmentally. Um, you know, if you have a child now, if you're lucky to see the back of it by the time it's 20, really, let alone... <laughs> <laughs> um, in infancy but you've got a year before the child's going to walk you've got two and a half years before it can communicate using language um, you've got about three to four years before the child is able to manage self with just a moderate amount of recourse to grown-ups that's a long time and that's only got you to school I mean, it hasn't got any further than that um, so one of the, the, the great tasks in development is to get this immature anxiety ball functioning. Um, and to do that, you've got to have um, available people, which are usually called parents. In passing, it's worth, it's worth actually pointing out that in the past, um, in develop, you know, if you go back to the African savannah where you've got where humans emerged. One of a group of hominids, um, probably, we don't know, is it 1720 varieties, mm -hmm. species, of which we only remain, uh, which says something about us. Um, but probably, we, our young were brought up by groups, we lived in groups of biologically related people, about 60, 70 tribes, a, a tribe, essentially. Obviously, a lot has happened since then. But one of the interesting things, I think, is that, you know, if you really want to design a way to bring up kids, would you actually have a nuclear family to do it? I'm not sure you would. It would make more sense, as a lot of societies still do, to bring children up um, with a support network, usually of biologically related women and older children, actually. Um, but the point about this in terms of affect regulation is that, the task is for the baby to learn how to regulate the self in order actually to be sociable. Um, anybody who's listened to me, you know, still listen to this stuff. Uh, Alan Shaw is a well-known writer on the neuroscience of development, where the right brain essentially comes on stream after birth. That's the social brain. So a lot of what's going on actually has to happen after birth. And affect regulation is a posh word of trying to describe how parents and baby come together to sort out how they're going to live together. And people talk about co-regulation. In other words, to begin with, a lot of the work has to be done by the adults, but actually the baby bit by bit starts to pick up tips states of mind from the from the adults and can actually start to use adults and other older children even to manage their stuff when they start to get anxious because children so, imitate a lot don't they so if you have they do. adults yeah. stay calm except when actually it's time to panic yeah. um, <laughs> then, then the child can learn something about it. <laughs> absolutely when's you the know. right time to panic <laughs> On the other hand, every, you can both panic together and you can go up, you know, to a yeah, of course. Um, <laughs> If anybody happens to be watching this, you know, this isn't a self-help um, talk. I've no idea how to bring up your kids, except you'll probably do it right because culturally that's what you're going to do. You're actually going to bring up your kids to fit into your tribe pretty much. And, yeah, get a support network. That would be the other tip. Wouldn't it? Um, but if we go back to the, the issue of damage, really, um, the problems seem to kick in where you get, first of all, obvious problems, such as drug and alcohol problems in mother. So one of the areas is where babies are born withdrawing from um, you know, methadone or heroin or whatever. 
and actually may well end up in the special baby unit or something like that. That's extreme. The next set of really big problems is neglect, essentially, uh, where parents are just not available for their kids. And this has to be extreme because uh, I think the research shows that even the most switched on parent is only attentive to their bambino about 30% of the day, you know. Um, actually, most parents don't pay attention to what's going on. Most parents actually manage to do something useful when they realise there's a problem. That seems to be what, what happens. But there are children, of course, whose parents are depressed, who are maybe actually living in environments where survival is almost too difficult for the adults, let alone the, the kid, you know, to bring up a child as well. Um, where parents, uh, mental illness, and also addictions, of course, we are just spaced out and not available. So for those children, there is an absence of somebody. It's not, it, um, and that actually can, in some cases, be serious. The other real issue is fear. Frightening babies is not difficult. You know, you've only got a <coughs> grimace and the baby will freeze like that. Um, you don't actually have to hit babies to silence them. You can actually um, frighten them. There's an argument in the, in the, the literature around dissociation, you know, which really means the ability to switch off and take yourself out of your body when things are getting really scary. This is very primitive stuff, actually, and it's actually not that difficult. It's fight, flight, freeze. Um, I also used to, when I was teaching, I used to say to the students, you know, if you want to know about all this stuff, go and watch anything by David Attenborough. Uh, uh, recently, Atters has got into um, the environment saving the planet, which is great. You know, I'm not knocking it. But I found it more interesting when he was doing the other stuff, which was how do you survive as a species? And that's about everything he does is how do you stay alive? How do you stay alive long enough to have young? And how do you keep them alive long enough to pass on your genes? And that's essentially what we're all doing. You know, we've dressed it up in a lot of fancy stuff, but basically we are just animals. You know, that's it. Um, the issue of dissociation really comes out of freezing, which is a very primitive response to danger. Uh, but humans actually can't freeze for very long periods. A lizard or a reptile is actually able to almost stop breathing for quite a long period. Whereas actually not, we need so much oxygen just to keep our brains going that we actually can't do that. Um, but dissociation is seen as a, as a major part of the problem for the kind of kids we were talking about who might end up in the mulberry bush. But if we go back, I, I, I'm talking rather a lot here, but you've got you know, oh, no, an that's interesting fine. topic, you know. Um, can, just to go on, because your point, George, was about, you know, how for some of these kids, this is strategic. Yeah, of course it is. Because actually, when you think about it, um, the baby as responding to the environment, um, for babies for whom affect regulation, in other words, the ability to manage your stuff with other people is absent or seriously impaired, they're going to do something. And of course, once they start doing it, they're going to do more of it if they kind of get the sense it works or less of it if they think it doesn't. And on top of that, the world, parents, teachers respond to them. So what you get is quite a lot of children, hope, in fact, most of them will, organize use what they have to get the best out of the environment they're in and although the adults often will talk about these kids as being you know emotionally disturbed challenging behavior for the child it's often really quite functional the issue however for the the bush kids for some of them the mulberry bush kids yeah the mulberry bush kids was that what we saw is that for some of them had long-standing problems with trying to manage their states. Now, one of them, uh, it, we call it somatic signs, or in other words, it's where bad stuff is in your body but can't be expressed in any way. And indeed, the child is incapable of even expressing what it is the problem is. It goes right, right back in, in development. So the child. So you, the hang on, can I just say, goes back in development to a point before they had speech. You mean they yeah, developed the does. problem before yeah. they could speak, um, yeah. so they never learned to be able to <clears throat> talk about something. They don't have a language for it. They don't even understand what it is. Yeah. So they've learned a kind of physical reaction. 
Yeah, and it things like ticks, um, mm -hmm. coughing, uh, scratching. It comes out in that way. I'm not sure it started in that way, but they are when when anxious. When anxious. Ideally, what you would do, and we're now talking about interviews, what we did in the research was a dole play exercise, which we might come to talking about how, um, how we assessed all this stuff. But in the, it's a, basically a little interview with doles and yeah, that asks them to finish as a story, the child to finish the story. Now, when very anxious, a lot of kids would hopefully use the adult to try and get out of a hole. They'd actually, you know, say, what do you want me to do? Or God, I, don't, I can't think. Um, or this is very stressful or something. For the children we're most concerned about, actually, a lot of them are unable to do that. They are unable to use adults as a way of co-regulating, of managing their stuff. They feel that it's up to them to keep a lid on anxiety quite often. These are very actually inhibited children. Uh, what you actually get is a state, if you like, of dissociation at times. So it's massive inhibition with massive anxiety. It's a bit like having a car where you've got all the brakes on and the engine and the accelerator down at the same time. It's <laughs> um, this produces states where at some point the kids just blow up. So you get sudden intrusions of feelings which they forbid, forbidden emotions usually anger fear desire for comfort for, and for people who know know the territory are using saying things and i could we could be referencing all this stuff underneath but we'll just keep this keep the pot going with so anger fear desire for comfort explosions um well, one of the interesting things is that quite often children will be signaling to adults that there is a problem but i think quite often in context of school uh, maybe foster care adults miss miss the cues or the adult wants the child to behave or do something so what kind, what kind of signals might there be then is this um, self-harming is this self-harming is um a slightly different area i think mm -hmm. uh, okay it depends if it's done to attract attention or actually just to get a sense of self mm -hmm. um so, uh, for some children actually will go away and self-harm and actually do it privately and it's actually not about attention it's about trying to get a sense of being alive actually a sense of re being real um but quite often in the the Margaret Bush examples what you could see was children actually doing just social things like say in this interview George I'm getting a bit tired do you think we could stop you know could we have a couple of minutes um but we motor on and I would get more and more up 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 to the point where suddenly i do something extreme. The adults quite often will see that as the piece that needs attention. So in other words, he's challenging or she's, you know, mm. provocative. Actually, for those kids, that's not what's going on. Um, it's, it's more to do with an inability to use people, actually, to manage self. So it actually then opens up another whole area about how you manage all this. Well, I'm, I'm wondering, Steve, about... <clears throat> how, how many people are understanding this? I'm thinking about social workers, foster carers, um, guardians involved in care proceedings, schools, teachers, you know. How many people, when they see these children, are misreading that? I think it would be very easy, actually, because they would just be reacting to this explosion. You know, why can't he just or why can't she just, you know, settle down? Don't behave like that. You know, make, you know, get calm again. I, I, can, I can really think that this is something that a lot of people are missing. Yeah, the, 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 Bush, uh, the Marbury Bush study showed that uh, there was a group of children, the ones that predicted the most problems, that the, um, the adverse childhood experiences was actually, first of all, parental ill mental health in parents, but they were one group all on their own. And, the, and there was another group, which was a much more of a mixture, which included neglect, uh, domestic violence, and also having a mother who was under the age of 19 when, when the child was born. Um, mental health, very young mothers would actually be a, it would be a precursor for um, neglect, really, mental neglect, you know, the affect regulation problems. It's not to say that all mental health, you know, parents with mental illness are going to 
have produced all these problems, or that being a young mum in itself is a problem. It's not, but it's usually a combination of things. But to answer your question, I think um, for quite a long time, because this starts in infancy and just goes on, it becomes part of the child and people stop looking at it. That's one thing. A second thing is that there is now a renewed interest in body, bodily states. The, there's a, a noticeable shift from an emphasis on talk therapies to um, body therapies, body talk, somatic states. Um, and uh, we're actually doing some work with um, Aideen Brennick and colleagues um, occupational therapy and attachment actually trying to get into this but there are a lot of other there are other people doing this as well it's so i think it, it's becoming more back into the mainstream which it should um i think there's also an issue of what to do about it i'm not sure we always know actually i think um the certainly the marble children had probably had a lot of interventions without a lot of success for the time before they got there so if you if you for example were to pick up that a child is sending genuine signals that they're getting too pressurized, for example, and they're asking for a break or they're asking, and, and you know, rather than, obviously, rather than just pushing on and saying, now we're really getting to the <clears throat> meat of it, so we'll push on, you do actually comply with the child's wish to back yeah. off and reduce yeah. the pressure. You still have to take advantage of that situation, don't you, to understand yeah. what it was that was happening for that child. Yeah. And to be sensitive to it. I and mean, what is so interesting listening to this is it reflects so much what we were listening to with Naomi Murphy talking about the mm. high, the category A prisoners at Whitemore oh, Prison. Right. Yeah. Um, men who, again, had a huge history of childhood abuse and neglect, but who had progressed through into the prison system and were lifers uh, with no prospect of release because they were so dangerous. Yeah. And the therapy that they're trying with them to help them to connect with uh, like emotions and and to use the therapy in a in a constructive way rather than um, just repeating the prison discipline of punishment and isolation and um, aggression the gr aggressive atmosphere that these men are so familiar with very comfortable with and and her description of how uncomfortable those men are. With, men, with people being kind to them and, and actually trying to understand their feelings and the mistrust yeah. they have at the ages of 40 or 50 or whatever they are at that stage uh, of, of people who are actually trying to pay attention to them and, and encourage them to feel their feelings. So clearly this is a, what you're describing in these children can progress mm. unchanged into yeah. these category A, very dangerous, uh, very dangerous adults. I think that's right. I mean, these the childhoods of these guys are the ones, the childhoods that we're talking about. Um, it's interesting. I think um, uh, quite a lot of this you could reconfigure in terms of comfort disorders. So in other words, it's a problem of in intimacy, actually, and receiving and giving comfort. Um, yeah. The... This, I know this may be a good time to start to get into this. Um, this is a kind of murky world, actually, uh, in the sense that when you work with, and I'm talking here about children who've had really nasty experiences. Mm. Um, you know, this is not the average, you know, average child behaviour stuff. Really. Um, but you're I'm talking about children who've had serious uh, experiences of neglect violence, abuse. Um, what you get actually in nine, 10 year olds is sometimes extremely chilling. So this is when you're doing doll play with kids. So you give them the beginning of a story, you know, like uh, Bill John has done a picture and it's the best picture he's ever done. And he brings it home, shows it to his parents, tell me and show me what happens next. And, um, the next thing you know, someone's dead or um, uh, mm. stuff has happened. Um, now, the issue of comfort here is for some children, comfort um, was unavailable and they are responsible for managing themselves. They're kind of the ones we talked about earlier, actually. Um, 
and for them comfort is forbidden and it's a problem it's rather like you were describing with the prisoners i mean you see it in adoption often actually where a family a couple will adopt a four-year-old child and often these kids are quite attractive it's you know there is a sort of market i suppose in adoption i mean people want a complete family and so you adopt this delightful looking child who smiles a lot um but then about a year in what the adopted parents are finding is that this child will not accept intimacy or comfort love if you like it's verboten from the child the child will seek it when they want it but they won't accept it from you and in the extreme cases the child can't accept it so what was inhibited in parents early on for whatever reason the parents were not able to give affection and you know basic sort of arousal management the child is now bought into that in the sense that they don't trust it either so the child is somewhat isolated and tries to comfort itself. Now, out of that come problems. And one of the problems you get in at the school years, the sort of six to puberty group, is what is called inappropriate sexual behaviour, whatever that is. Um, what it means really is that the child is doing things that look sexual either with other children or with adults, like, you know, touching adults or doing something. And for that, some of those kids, it's actually a comfort problem. What you've really got is a massive intrusion of a desire to get close to somebody, and it gets out of, it turns into what looks like a sexual assault. So those kids, or if you like, are on a pathway where intimacy is difficult to receive. And actually, it's much easier to get into intimate situations as an adolescent where you get very stoned. Although I'm unreliably informed that the British, you know, sex in the British is actually dependent on alcohol for anything to happen when people first meet. But I'm not sure that that's right or wrong. But, um, <laughs> um, but there's certainly a problem around getting intimacy. Um, now, that's one group. The other group are the chilling group, actually. Um, and I can't prove this totally. But I do, what I do know is it seems to be boys, for starters, this group I'm talking about here. I think a lot of these boys have been in context of domestic violence. So what they've grown up with is climates of fear where they're unable to seek comfort because the people who will give it are actually hitting each other. Um, they get off on it to some extent, I'm afraid. I think they get quite excited by it. And the children. They, the children. Mm -hmm. And they also denigrate their mothers or women. So this is a group of boys for whom women are seen as really, um, um, they come up with some really, really, really um, scary stuff, actually, you know. Um, just a quick example, um, the child asks the interviewer, um, which way do babies come out? And the interviewer says, oh, this way. And, uh, and he gets a baby, puts it up the, the skirt of a, of a doll, and then asks the interviewer to punch it, and we're now going to kill this baby. This is scary, I think. you know. And it's done with considerable charm, this example. The comfort problem, it seems to me, for these kids is that not only is comfort unavailable, which is the previous group, but for them, they've denigrated it. I don't need it. I trash it, you know? Uh, the iconic mother and baby, we would just destroy her. Um, and for those boys, one fears for them in the future and one fears for society, actually, um, because actually these kids too could well end up in... Um, very quite abusive relationships. Um, and for the, a, a few out of those would be the, I suppose what you call psychopathic kind of profiles. In other words, um, we did some work, we've done some case studies, not huge really, it's uh, like COVID rather put a stop to it, but we were interested in heart rate and various other physiological measures to see, you know, how the, what happened in these kids' bodies when they were telling these stories. 
Um, and there was a group who looked absolutely quite like, every, as far as we know, whatever average is, they looked fairly average. So in other words, they could tell very gruesome statistic stories while actually being quite cool. Um, but in both cases, going back to the Whitemore, these are both cases for whom children would, these kids, both groups would distrust well-meaning, naive adults. Um, mm. You know, the therapy world's had a long, bold and secure base, fine. But if secure base, nice comfort actually signaled danger in the past, that's something you would not actually respond to. And, uh, and that is a real issue. It actually highlights just how difficult it is once these problems come to on stream, just yeah. how difficult it is for people to do something about it. I don't think they're quick solutions. And um, no, another conversation we've had, Steve, <coughs> is with is with Chris Dore, who's a QC and one of the leading defence barristers in the country, who's written a book in which he's promoting two ideas because of his experience of seeing so many so many people being sent to prison um, that children should never be criminalised and that prisons should be completely reviewed and started again. But, I mean, we were talking to him about the children, and he's suggesting there needs to be another approach to children who are kind of age 10, therefore treated as having criminal responsibility, and, and who then become um, labelled as criminals and follow a path which usually dooms them to repeated yeah. imprisonment and gradual brutalization or even more brutalization than they've already experienced and and so the question i suppose is what can you do other than just containing these children who are frightening or out of control i mean can is there an effective intervention that anybody has has been able to demonstrate first off interesting i was a probation officer at, when i started my career in um, the late 60s, actually, I think, early 70s. And I think I'm right in saying, somebody better check this out, that at that time, the criminal system and the welfare system for children was the same, that actually they went to the same court. Um, so if you were subject to care proceedings or divorce, well, not divorce uh, or criminal proceedings, you went through the same door and went into the same court. I think that was true. I know if it was, they separated it the british i think we're as a nation are quite a punitive bunch actually i think we you know our record in europe is not great when you look at the number of people in prison and so forth um the going back to the developmental stuff the group i was talking about for whom are dissociative want feel responsible for their own stuff i think i'm probably a treat much more treatable actually uh i think it's about self a lot of the time and that what we need to do is to help these children experience a sense of self generate use their own feelings as information um i think it, that can work and i've certainly could quote case examples where i've seen that working for the more sadistic uh, for the children who are denigrating warmth and are actually, what they're really doing is meeting danger head on at the pass. Yeah? The other group are essentially defending themselves, hide, freeze, smile at them. The, the alternative is this, this second group who actually are, you do this to me, I'll do it back to you. Not only when I do it back to you, I'll do it better than you did it to me, I'll fool you. Um, so this group is much, much more difficult, I think, to work with um, because it does demand a, a challenging of the way people think. So and we get into a muddle because what you really have got is the situation where you've got, you know, like a 10 year old, say, who clearly is still a child and needs to be cared for as a child, but also is developing a mindset that actually probably should be challenged you know in other words not an unconditional positive regard that kind of therapy where you accept people for totally what they are i'm not sure that's going to work for those children uh, how many are uh, what's the proportion boys and girls with that group i don't i don't know um would you I, think I, mainly mainly boys or, or I not think mainly boys 
mainly boys. I suspect mainly boys. Mm. The other thing now, currently, I mean, these gangs, of course, which I don't yeah. know much about personally, um, because I kind of retired out of that. Uh, but what what you see now is the gang has become a, you know, a, 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 a protective group, because we, the adults, society cannot provide that, and it's pretty depressing, actually. Um, it's easier to sort yourself into quite low states actually with this. Um, but I certainly would go for early years intervention, big time. And what do you think happens uh, to the Mulberry Bush children? What do you think is, um, and because they're in, a, in an expensive, intensive uh, yeah. therapeutic environment with skilled people uh, trying to help them, um, and they've obviously presented overwhelming difficulties to get themselves there in the first place. Do you know what what the outcomes are like? Um, I don't actually. I think we ought to ask them. Yeah, so we can have, do a, that. have a link. Yeah, I think that would be fair. I know that they have a group of children who come back to them and see them. So they obviously have a, an ongoing, you know, a group who've actually value the, what they did. A problem they have is that they all leave, I think, at 13. I don't think that you can stay after that. So this is only a provision for three, mm. like seven to 12 year olds or something like that. Mm. Um, and do you know so, if there's a provision for the older children or are they just out in the wild? <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I don't know what happened. It'd be interesting, but I, I don't know. I don't know. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So you, you're, you're looking at the way they're responding to these story stems. You present yeah. them with a, a story and see what they produce. And that's and that is an approach you can actually analyze. Is it? There's something you can do yeah. with that kind of <clears throat> it is, information yeah. to try and categorize them in this. Uh, you know, because you're talking about categories, aren't you? The ones who are yeah. comfort yeah. seeking and the ones who are that's right. Not. Yeah. Yeah. What, what kind of clues do you get from their behavior that helps you to understand whether they're the more uh, kind of perhaps optimistic group? <laughs> of comfort seekers versus the hard-boiled, uh, yeah. triumphant, uh, revenge-seeking um, psychopaths. psychopaths. <laughs> it's hard. Yeah, don't, 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 don't write these kids off. The change is always possible. We remain ever optimistic. I know. I'm being uh, ironic. I'm being yeah. ironic. I'm, and of course, you can go into the professions or become a politician or run a business. Yeah, and succeed of, marvelously in that very successful way. psychopath around. Yes. <laughs> Um, the story stems has been around since the 80s, maybe earlier. Um, it's a well known, a lot of groups use it. So, uh, the basic is the basic idea is um, you do it with a, somebody you the child doesn't know, so that raises anxiety to elicit defensive behavior. You need to raise the anxiety in the subject just enough, and you do that by first of all doing some stories with somebody they don't know. And two, these stories are all about protection. So uh, sometimes there's a warm up story, but there's stories about getting lost, about getting hurt, about being bullied, you know, about being separated, those kinds of things. Um, the interviewer gives them the beginning of a story. Uh, you've got a few props, doll's house or whatever, you know, minimal props, ideally. Gives them the beginning of the story, and I gave you an example of a child coming home with a picture they've done, which is obviously pulling for praise. Um, and then you ask the child to tell me and show me what happens next, and we film it. And it'd be nice to be able to give examples, but ethically it's difficult. No, of course people, you can't. No, um, understandable. Yeah. Uh, uh, we, we'll hope to get some actors maybe to give some demonstrations for that people to look at. Um, how do we analyse it? Crucially, first of all, the relationship of the child with the interviewer. So in other words, how does the child manage their stuff with the interviewer? Um, can they, are they, do they find it interesting? Are they kind of cooperative? On the other hand, are they very anxious about being getting it wrong? Are they looking for the, you know, smiling? Thing? Is that the right answer? Um, or on the other hand, does it turn into something of a struggle between the child and the interviewer? In other words, the and you can either use passive aggression so that you can be um, just refuse to do it, if you like, at one level, or you can be very incompetent. Or, for example, you can set the whole doll's house up and that will take you about 20 minutes. 
put the family in the house. At the end of 20 minutes, you can suck your thumb for five minutes and decide, no, we're doing do it another way now. So an hour goes by and nothing happens. Or, of course, you can be just pushy. Oh, um, I'll give the toss. Um, but the relationship with the interviewer, the observed state of arousal, so that, and this is very important, actually, and what you, I'm sure anybody watching this <coughs> now will see, in, certainly in me, state of arousal. You could plot what I've been doing up and down on a curve. You've got nothing better to do. Um, so what we're interested in is how does the child manage arousal with the interviewer? And what you will see is a curve, like it's going up and down, like a wave. Um, arousal goes up at points where the story raises anxiety. And now will the child be able to resolve it on their own and things plateau out a bit? Or will the child get actually very even more anxious and not be able to use the interview? Um, <clears throat> to the point where either the child gets very, very high and starts walking around the room. Or conversely, actually may get very, very low. Now, this is, again, in the territory of very maltreated kids. But what you see is sudden slumps of arousal. I, think, I forget which crime writer it was, but some, somebody talking about, you know, when people are interviewed in police stations uh, and they're guilty, um, when the detectives go out the room and the camera's on and the guy's on his own, what you'll see is actually for people who probably didn't do it, they're anxious and look at their watches looking around. The guys who did it just go to sleep. <laughs> you know, arousal just goes, shroom. And then, and then the detective comes around the room and they're up again. And actually you see something like that in, in, in the dissociative group of kids. Um, their arousal can be literally on the floor. They will actually get on their knees and they'll be low and they'll be yawning. And then they'll suddenly crank up and it'll go up, 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 up. So you can actually observe this. And this, of course, goes on all day with all of us. What they're doing is what we all do, but in a very extreme way without recourse to the interview. The alternative is, bought, and actually now, if you want to go back to the quotes of the more... I don't like the word psychopathic, but the group we were talking about, you know, the more sadistic, comfort um, denigrating group. Um, boredom is a problem. Boredom. Uh, and I know kids use the word boredom a lot. You know, it's a kind of portmanteau word, I'm bored. Uh, usually it means something like, you're not attending to me, or I don't feel thought about, or, you know. Um, but boredom in this group, is more like a state of ennui. It's a, an acute sense of um, emptiness, really. And the solution to that is to pick a fight with the interviewer. So in other words, you actually use the interviewer to up your own arousal. Um, and you can do that in numbers of ways. Um, the most chilling way is to tell a story which is just totally shocking, like the one I gave you the example of with the baby and the punching the baby um, uh, and that will draw in interviews spooking the interviewer um, so relationship with the interviewer and arousal you can probably do most of it on that actually but if you want to get the a bit more clever we look at the way the stories are told both the patterns of speech and the play yeah. this comes straight out of the adult attachment interview which of course you know yeah. about um it's a very highfalutin, interesting. But it's a bit, it's a bit too of, subtle to 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 describe. I think. Yeah, too, um, uh, well done. Yeah, let's leave that out. <laughs> <laughs> Except to say that it's about it's about not what's told, but how is it told, and yeah. you get information there about, for example, cutting stuff off at bad points, minimising feelings, and so forth. And then we actually have indicators for trauma. And these are really when uh, points where bad things start to go on in the stories. And one of the interesting things about the Mulberry Bush study was that up until then, people were quite cagey about saying, you know, if a child plays out abusive scenarios, this is this is this forensic? Is it does it actually predict what's gone on? Actually, it does, uh, except for sexual abuse. Interestingly enough. So what we found was um, children who played out violence had been involved in either domestic violence or physically abused. Neglect, yeah, neglect. Um, drug, alcohol, that came out quite clearly. 
mental health sometimes. Uh, sexual behaviour, though, we didn't predict sexual abuse or sexualized content in the stories, didn't predict sexual abuse. It's also important to say that you get a lot of false positives. So in other words, if you, if you say you've got 50 children and out of them 30 had actually, we know, experienced physical abuse, maybe out of those 30, only 10 would tell stories with physical abuse. So it's, um, and it changed. We, did, we actually looked at them at two time points, two years apart. And it doesn't necessarily come up both times. So this is, you know, it's, 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 it's got severe lim limitations. But actually in the story, what we're interested in is where the child gets lost in bad stuff or where the child is telling you things that have to be true. You know, there's a kind of chilling reality to it. When you say lost in it, do you mean lost. They, they lose They've the track lost. of the story or they... They... Um, they lose track of the interviewer. Hmm. They've lost. It's like the interviewer is no longer there hmm. and they get... It's called stuck play, actually, where they just get... To, I guess in adults it would be where somebody is absolutely preoccupied with something and it goes to therapy but just talks about the same thing every every week. Um, mm. So they're stuck in it. It's like going around a wheel. There's no relief, no change in, mm. um, uh, no way of getting out of it. Um, Hypervigilance is another one, actually, where children are hear noises the interviewer can't hear, or will even do things like get up and look out the window, or suddenly spin around to look at the door. So there's um, a huge amount of information in these videos. Yeah, surprising. And do you have to do you have to play them back slow motion to pick up the detail, or do you? Is can you just see it from you know experienced watching? The more you do it, the more you can pick out stuff. But it's usually yeah. um, you have to do it at least twice. So it takes a while to. Okay. Yeah, yes, it's a fascinating, it's a fascinating area because um, it's so little understood, isn't it? And trying to pick out what's going on in the child's brain from what yeah. you see on the surface is, uh, you know, it's a huge challenge because there's so many filters that have been built by the time the child's arrived at your at your research. Can I? I do want to take it a bit further uh, because I'm. I'm, no, no, I'm no, no, carry on. Sorry. <laughs> I'm thoroughly, I'm thoroughly depressed now about, I think being right. I, I've always thought how difficult care proceedings are, but I, I know now from what you've said, Steve, that we, we take these cases to court. I think it's worse now than previously when I was working where you did get experts involved in cases. But my understanding now is you rarely get an expert in a case. And I'm just thoroughly depressed about what people actually make of these children, what actually happens to these children, how much help they need, whether parents get any help at all. Um, I think we must be doing a terrible disservice to families who get involved. Uh, well, they don't get involved. They don't choose to, but who are subject to care proceedings because it seems to me as though the professionalism has gone completely and the chances of actually being able to get the right outcome for the specific child is probably very remote. Um, I actually do a consultancy still with a, a local authority. So I do two days a month. Um, so I get involved in mainly story stems or other interviews, some for care proceedings. Um, this particular authority is very of adverse to taking children into care. So it has very high thresholds for care proceedings, actually. Um, I, I, you know more than me, and I suspect it varies around the mm, country. Mm, it um, does. Very considerably, actually. Um, so one thing, I, a number of things. First of all, you don't go into care unless things are seriously bad. They don't actually go for proceedings unless no. it's got very serious. Secondly, I my impression it's always difficult because the older you get, the more kind of you think the world's going to hell on a handcart. But um, <laughs> I, the, the cases are just absolutely awful. Yeah. Actually. Um, yeah. And. There's a sense that I think there's certainly more guns about, there's more violence, there's people trafficking, there's gangs, mm. there's children caught up in, you know, drug dealing and things. And like knife that. crime. Yeah. And knife crime. Um, so that 
actually means that the challenge for the social workers is extreme. Social work actually, although it's called social work, actually doesn't do much socially, really. Um, and whatever you do as a therapist, or if, if you start from that end, you, you can't do anything with the environment that people live in. And that actually is a major mm. issue. And that clearly is of huge concern, actually, to everybody. Um, so there's that to it. Now, assessments. I don't know. Um, I, I get involved in a few. I think some cases get assessed to death. Others probably not. I don't think people act on assessments much. Really, my no, that's true. Been, yeah. you can make all sorts of observations which nobody ever does anything with. The road to um, care proceedings is pretty predictable. Um, these cases have been open for years, most of the time. Uh, the amount of interventions vary hugely. Um, they all, if you want to assess something, do it at the beginning, really. Otherwise, all assessment, you know, I got fed up with actually being involved in cases where all they wanted was me to say something nasty, really, and then beat the parents up even more than they had been already. I mean, that's uh, care proceedings should be about what we know factually about the care and protection of kids. Um, the issue around why people do what they do and all, all that should have happened beforehand. That's a, an intervention thing. It should be around. So I think there's an absence of and um, good levels of intervention for families. It, it's very hard. Doesn't happen. Yeah, doesn't happen give very you one, much. Give you one example. In my experience is that, and I do a lot of work with foster kids, loads, right? And adoption. Adoption. There's plenty of money in the adoption support fund, so that has spawned an industry. This is the political thing here, folks, by the way, we're getting into, obviously. Um, there's an industry around the adoption, um, partly because David Cameron liked adoption and, you know, good. It's worth investing in. There are problems, I think, but maybe another story. Um, but foster care is a much bigger area. You know, adoption is a very small part of the welfare system. Foster care is huge. Mm. I don't, what, what was it now? Seventy-eight, I don't know, thousand children or something—a lot. Yeah. And there should be a the same level of provision for these kids. So what we find is that there is no money for therapy. They actually do not have the money to work with children. So once you're in care, there's an idea that you've been rescued, and after that, not a lot goes on. Mm. No, I think that's true. I think that's uh, and, true. Uh, until you become, uh, the child actually kicks off and all the kinds of stuff we've been talking about. And then you you might end up at the mulberry bush and the fees there are big, um, mm -hmm. as they are in. And there are therapeutic, there's an industry, as you know, growing up around foster care. I mean, private yeah. fostering agencies, people with setting up um, uh, foster, some which are probably very good, so others less so, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, but there is a huge lack of provision and also early years provision. There should, I think a universal kind of short start for everybody would be ideal, you know. So it'd be non-discriminatory. It wouldn't be about just picking up families people are worried about. It should be available to all families. Mm. Um, because all parents actually have trouble, you know, any parent. Anybody who's said, mm. I've got one lately, but um, if you're trying to have work everywhere lots of people have to work and bring up their kids uh, there are lo lots of problems uh, which everybody faces um, but if you then add on the environment that some families are going to be living in and the adverse problems they've got then of course that makes it even diff more difficult mm. well, well my one example of the mulberry bush i only ever I think from memory was involved in it once but i was um involved where there was a, a group of children one one of those children was seriously problematic. Um, and the guardian, and I was involved because I was representing the child through the guardian, the guardian recommended that he go to the Mulberry Bush School. And the local authority position on that was that he didn't need to go because they could do exactly what the Mulberry Bush <laughs> could do. And I was taken to one side after a meeting by a, a manager 
uh, a local authority manager, where I was berated for actually having the cheek <laughs> to um, push for this because that was what I was being instructed to do. And, I, and right. I, it was suggested that I might like to think about that. I did think about it, of course, and we pressed on and the child went to the Marbury Bush School. But, you know, that's the kind of thing that you ha- you, you really have to fight for these kids to get them any what would people would be described as extra help. And when it's such an expensive, you know, when it's such an expensive thing, the, the argument is, well, that child can't have it because, look, we've got all these other children that might yeah. benefit from it. And why should that child have it? And my <laughs> attitude is yeah. that child is the one in court. That child is the one with the guardian who's recommending it. And that child has me to represent in court. And we're going to go and ask the judge to make that order. You, you know, it's set, we, the, the kind of arguments are bizarre. Um, mm. But but all children should have the best help they they should you know they can but clearly it's never and acknowledge the problem that everybody faces yeah in working out how to handle this especially with the 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 pattern of society with nuclear families isolated parents now i would have respected that local authority if i'd been taken aside and said god knows how we're going to pay for this we don't have the money i would have at least understood that but not we can do it as well as this this therapeutic community they never Mm. explained how they never they never came up with an alternative plan other than just leave it to us you know Mm -hmm. we'll put this child in foster care um but it's you know this must be going on all over the country everywhere Mm. mustn't it true i think you know um there are successes maybe (laughs) i'm just thinking there are are. it's easy to you know i so I think I do have the effect on people making them feel very negative, actually. <laughs> um, but I actually um, can quote you people I worked with 40 years ago who I bump into occasionally, a lot of whom worked out pretty well, some less though. Um, and <clears throat> what people actually say, what seems to be important is that somebody along, along the line that you can make a relationship with somebody who actually can yeah. offer you something, you know. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> some kind of mentor or just it could be all sorts of people sports coach teacher yeah something somebody along the line that, that just tips the difference and it, it does seem to work and there yeah. are a lot of people like that around a lot of things going on um, yeah and that's what the extended family can do or the or the, or the yeah. tribe as it were it, yeah. you, you know if your own parents uh, limited in what they can offer you then you can always turn to a, you hope you can turn to an uncle an aunt a grandparent or maybe neighbours, and there are plenty of people who've been brought up by neighbours, for example. Um, yeah, you know, because they offered the kind Absolutely. of care that their family couldn't. Um, um, yeah, Pat Crind and I went wrote an article ages ago um, called "Fostering Families," where we reckon well, just foster the entire family. Really, um, mm-hmm. it may seem a little idealistic, but uh, although somebody said to me that actually there was somebody trying it out at the moment. What you see yeah, in um, kinship care, of course, is the fact that the tribe stays together um, mm. and that you're, in terms of identity, your story, it, the problem in foster care, once you become detached from your family and are a corporate, you know, you have a corporate parent, your um, identity is, begins to get shattered and eroded, particularly yeah. if you go into care very young. Mm-hmm. Whereas actually identity is, it seems to me is as much about being known as it is about knowing things. So people who know you um, and kinship care, staying, trying to keep families together actually achieves that obviously automatically. Um, and it's not for, I don't think it's for outsiders. Some, the life story works is a kind of interesting thing, which I could actually just done a course on it, actually taught one. Um, but I do have quite strong views about, professionals almost like you know, if, you, if you're not careful you take over the child's life you know it's not for us to tell other people what their life is it's for them to figure out what it is it's a bit different mm. um, well when we were doing parenting assessments <coughs> residential parenting assessments for the family court uh, years ago uh, there were some cultural groups who never appeared uh, as families with uh, you know in in care proceedings Mm. Um, and to name uh, some, I mean, we never saw any Chinese families 
we never saw any Pakistani families or Bangladeshi oh. families. Very, very few Caribbean families. A few. Yeah. But this, this, the disconnected white working class, if I could put it that way, <laughs> who predominated. Mm, so that's true. Yeah. I think in the, the authority I'm connected with now, there, there are more um, Pakistani, Bangladeshi families, I think, mm. perhaps, than there used to be. Uh, mm. But I take the point, you yeah. know. Steve, I think we really will um, yeah. wind okay. up, let you off the hook. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Oh, right. Okay.